everyone, it's Trevor Corcum here, coming to you from Prince Edward Island, or the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Happy uh, Monday morning, or whatever time it is when you're watching this video. Some of you might know me from my days at BCCIE. I worked at BCCIE a number of years ago as the Director of Communications and Research, so hello to old colleagues, and hello to new friends, to those of you I haven't met before. So since I left BCCIE, I've been involved in a number of uh, very interesting research projects on the academic side of international education, primarily in Toronto. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the interests and, and things I found out in those projects that might be thought provoking or which might give us reason to think about migration and international education from a slightly new angle. So before I start, I'd just like to say that some of these uh, questions and things I was thinking about came out of my own experience as uh, an international student in Norway when I was 19. So just before I went to Norway as an international student, um, I came out. And so I went to Norway as a newly young um, queer Canadian man and had um, an idea of what my experience might be in Norway. And it wasn't really anything like I had imagined. I won't go into details, but all that to say is I became really interested in how we think about places and the stories we tell about places and about ourselves in particular places and spaces. So to put it differently, my research is really concerned with how our identities and the stories we tell about identities shift across time and space. So for one research project I was involved in in Toronto, I looked at the migration experiences of nine LGBTQ international students or international student graduates in Toronto and Southern Ontario. And I was interested in a couple of things. I was interested first off in how they imagined um, Canada before they came to Canada and what, how they imagined what their experiences as queer international students might be. Second, I was interested in how uh, their experiences actually played out, um, specifically within educational spaces, so the classroom and on campus, and then secondly, within the LGBT community and queer spaces like nightclubs and social spaces. Uh, and then the third, I was interested in how they navigated between different aspects of their identities and told different kinds of stories through their experiences. Um, so to consider kind of these, these larger questions of space, place, and identity, I looked at uh, what Dorothy Smith calls the relations of ruling. So the relations of ruling are, um, in a nutshell, how power and, and different social relations are organized within specific spaces. So within a bureaucracy or within um, an education institution or another institution. Um, so what happens when someone new um, comes from a different place into a space, a very specific space, which has been organized with particular relations of power within it? The second thing I thought about was um, Benedict Anderson's notion of imagined communities. So the idea that um, we all belong to sort of these communities which are actually fictional or imaginary. So, for example, the nation. Um, Canada, in a way, is a particular kind of story told by particular people for a specific um, reason. So the types of history we tell, the flag that we have, the ways that we imagine ourselves to be part of, um, of the nation are what Anderson calls imagined communities. Uh, so think then of the queer international student who maybe has been recruited to come to Canada uh, through uh, one of the institutions in Canada, has been told a particular story of Canada, or maybe has no notion of what Canada will be, but places upon Canada or the city or the institution um, all these kinds of hopes and dreams um, of, of what the experience will be like. So when I, I met with students uh, and we, I conducted a, a series of oral history interviews, uh, their stories, their very detailed stories, revealed to me a number of findings. Um, so one was 
what I just spoke about, this idea of the imaginary. So they had ascribed to Canada um, these ideas of um, diversity, of openness, of safety, and they imagined that um, Canada would be a place where they could be very open as LGBTQ international students. So uh, many of the students I spoke to, in fact almost all, had not been out uh, at home. And some of them knew they were queer and they believed that Canada would be the place they would um, come out. One student I spoke to, uh, Adil from India, sort of imagined based on the TV shows and movies he had seen that as soon as he arrived in Toronto he'd be able to come out, he would have all sorts of, of queer friends and so forth. Um, Sophia, a student from Singapore, imagined that um, you know she was going to connect with a lot of other lesbian nerds, as she called them, and have a great uh, network of friends. So, in part, some of these things did come true for some of the students I spoke with, but what uh, perhaps they weren't prepared for and what the findings revealed were a number of things. Number one was the fact that all of our identities are quite complex and, and intersectional. So issues of race and class actually became very important predictors of how safe and how welcome they would feel uh, within both educational and queer spaces. So a number of students, uh, of the gay male students or queer male students I spoke with, reported feeling higher degrees of racism within queer spaces in Toronto than in the city at large. So uh, while the dream of kind of going to a gay nightclub and feeling welcome and free uh, was a wish, the experience was actually a feeling of exclusion um, based on race and similar experiences based on class as well. So all that to say is that the particular social relations uh, within these spaces, the relations of ruling, uh, had a huge impact on the experiences of students. And the second thing I'll note is that the, the other thing I think people weren't prepared for is that while they knew that Toronto was a very diverse city uh, containing basically uh, most cultural communities from around the world, they weren't prepared for how that would affect their experiences. So Adil, the student I mentioned, who is an MBA student in Toronto, uh, found that within his classroom there were many, many other students from India um, who he felt judged him based on his religion, uh, his gender identity, and so on. So he actually felt the same types of constraints within his MBA classroom as he had felt back home in India because of the presence of so many other Indian students. Um, the same thing for David, uh, a gay man from a Caribbean island who I spoke to who you know came to Ontario and was very excited to be in residence and then realized that on his very floor in residence there were many other Caribbean male students and so that um, made him feel like he could not be as open and he, as he had hoped to be. So this kind of leads us to questions uh, both of the kinds of stories we might tell as uh, about a place before we come to it, but also the stories that are told to us about that place. Um, so just I'll, I'll leave you to kind of think about that for a second. Uh, but the, I guess the final thing that I want to say is that the research showed how malleable certain parts of our identities can be. So going back to my own experience in Norway and, and uh, echoed by some of the students I, I worked with in the research project, uh, identities um, are articulated in different ways in different spaces. So Lionel Cantu calls this border crossing. So the ways that we might in one particular space emphasize a certain part of our identity through a story. So for example, a part of our gender identity might be um, enhanced within a specific space in order to feel safe. So I might kind of perform masculinity in one particular space in order to feel safe. And that was a, a finding that came out through the research. So the final thought that I'll leave you with is to think about um, storytelling and the stories we tell with great care. So both from the recruitment perspective and not kind of trying to paint a, a perfect picture of, of a, an institution or a region or a city or a country, but making sure we're kind of telling as full of a story as we can. And then the second thing is to listen very carefully to the stories that um, students are telling us 
at our institutions or in our cities because uh, as doctors know in the medical field stories and the narratives we tell reveal very important information about what's actually going on so if we can look beyond statistics or fitting people into certain boxes or categories for bureaucratic reasons but in fact elicit the stories of, of people's lives and experiences they will point us to deep and complex and very rich truths that will help us in the profession become better advisors, better recruiters, better managers, and so on. So thanks for listening. Uh, have a great rest of the day today. And uh, thanks to Randall and everyone at PCCIE. Uh, take care. I'm going back to my coffee.